Welcome to What's the 401 Sports. I'm Naomi Gray. And I'm Gregory Alcala. And we want to give a warm welcome to Keisha Wilson, who is joining <laughs> us tonight. Hey, thank you. We're so happy to have you tonight. And Definitely. we all love sports, so we need to get to talking about it. And we're going to get into what's popping, Greg. Yes. So we got to talk about the Mets. My Mets. They won the uh, National League East Division crown this past weekend. Uh, they, they sweep the Cincinnati Reds, and I've been waiting for nine years. Like, it's been, they haven't won since 06, and after two straight collapses in 07 and 08, and several years of rebuilding, they finally crafted a team together that has the perfect blend between uh, arms and bats. So, um, Sandy also made you know, a lot of great moves since he's been here. He drafted Matt Harvey, traded for Noah Syndergaard, and he traded for Zach Wheeler, and that's pretty much become the strength of the Mets team. It's about pitching. So in this particular year, um, pitching was pretty much the strength, and their main problem was not putting enough offense on the board. They couldn't score a run. So in the uh, at midseason, at trading deadline, he added some premier bats. He got Yohan Cespedes. He brought in Yohan Uribe, and he brought in Kelly Johnson. And since then, they, the Mets have pretty much taken off. They've taken control of the National League, of the National League East, pretty much leaving the Net, the Washington Nationals in the, you know, the rearview mirror. And, for example, uh, this past September, they're on an eight-game winning streak. And you no, know, recently they lost their last three, but with the uh, the excitement of you know a potential playoff run coming up, and um, you know the city being excited again, they got in New York. They sweep the rest. They get the they get the crown, and now they can pretty much coast end the season on a good note. And right now their main focus is pretty much um, just trying to win uh, home court advantage in the uh, in the first round of the playoffs because they're going to be played to play against the Los Angeles Dodgers. So that's pretty much their uh, their main focus right now. Great. I'm glad to hear that a New York team is doing good. You know I'm not crazy about baseball. It's yeah. something I slowly need to get into, but I'm always all for you know, oh, yeah, New York yeah, teams yeah. on the rise. So yeah. some good news. You mentioned Matt Harvey, and I yes. think Matt Harvey is going to be an interesting uh, subject during the playoffs yes. in terms of his management. This is the first time since his Tommy John surgery last yeah. year that he's going to be playing. And at one point there was an innings restriction mm -hmm. on him, and he decided – Matt Harvey, that is, decided yeah. that he didn't want to have that restriction anymore. It went to the manager, Terry Collins, mm -hmm. told him that in order for him and the Mets to succeed, he needed yeah. that pitch count, that inning restrictions to be yeah. lifted. Uh, the, the manager went to Sandy Alderson. Yeah. Sandy Alderson said it's up to him. Mm -hmm. And so they are going to loosen the restrictions on yeah, him. So. It's just a matter of how much. And I think he's going to be one of the keys yeah. to how far the Mets will advance in the playoffs. Yeah. Well, he is the key. I mean, he's pretty much the face of the franchise. When he blew up a couple seasons ago, he really blew up. I mean, he had David Price um, tweeting about him, mm. but he's my favorite pitcher. So he's the face of the franchise. If the Mets are going to go deep in the playoffs, he's he's pretty much the ace. Yeah. So And then, like, there were, I mean, when they were losing, you heard all the reports about uh, DeGrom struggling and even Terry Collins saying that the team was um, playing stiff, which is something you really don't need to hear, but the yeah. fact that they – we're able to go to the Reds and beat up on a, a bad team, collect those wins, get the National East Division, put it behind them. So they don't have to think about clinching and all the pressure that that comes with it. They pretty much set themselves up to, um, you know, go deep into the playoffs. And on with the, the make of the team, it has a team, it has the make of a team that can go far. So I think this is this is really why um, you know fans are excited. Right, and I'm right. excited. That's great. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so you, you have some football news. Yeah, some you got to talk about the Jets. We got to recap the last two weeks. So, last week they beat the Indianapolis Colts 20-7. And despite the uh, the win, the defense pretty much um, pretty much won the game, pretty much. They got to the uh, quarterback recording like 11 hits. And they forced like two fumbles. The offense really struggled. They should have scored more points. But this past uh, Sunday, they really struggled against a desperate Philadelphia Eagles team. They lost 24-17. And, um, you know, they had some injuries, like uh, Eric Decker didn't play. Right. Chris Ivory was out, and mm -hmm. it really took a toll on the, the Jets' offense because they couldn't get a, a you know a running game going. Yeah. And Brandon Marshall had the onus on him to carry the load offensively. And in doing that, he Brandon Marshall probably made the worst play <laughs> of this NFL season thus yeah. far. And going forward, uh, I think the problem with the Jets is pretty much going to be – I think it's all about uh, being healthy. They need Chris Ivory. It really shows you how much and how important Eric Decker is because if Brandon Marshall is the only receiver, I think there was a stat that said 
the three receivers that are lining up with Marshall haven't caught a pass in the first two games. Mm-hmm. So that just goes to show you how important Decker is. Right. So you need him to be on the field. And um, and when you talk about the defense, you know, I just mentioned last week they put 11 hits on Angel Luck, the, yeah. the coach QB. On Sam Bradford, they only put six. Okay. So that shows you that they struggle to get to the quarterback. And the Philadelphia Eagles under Chip Kelly, I know you're going to talk about them. Uh, this is the first first time all season they actually looked like a Chip Kelly team. Right. They ran a no huddle offense. They really took the Jets defense by surprise, and they might be on something. Mm. What do you think of that, the quarterback situation? We had Ronnie <coughs> Fitzpatrick who turned the ball over three times. Yeah, three interceptions. Three interceptions Sweet. in one game is yeah. not a running recipe. It's not, but we can't <laughs> we can't get too, um, you know, frustrated because right. the season just started. He did get us to two wins. You know, this is only one week. Everybody's entitled to a struggling game. He did throw in three interceptions, but I don't think the Jets management is ready to turn over the ball to Geno. Yeah. Right, right, you know, right about now. So. No, I totally agree, and I feel like um, Brandon Marshall, the situation with him, he's a veteran player. So yeah. the whole lateral pass, it was, it was a disaster. You know what I mean? Because then the Eagles gained possession, and they scored off of that possession. So it was just something that just didn't need to happen. They were down seventeen and zero, yeah. and it was only a seven, you know, it was a seventeen yard pass. Just take the tackle. Yeah. You know, so instead of trying to make highlights and do crazy things, move forward. Do what you got to do. Get your points up. Yeah, you know what I mean? Because the teams are waiting for teams to make mistakes like yeah. this so they could recover the ball and then take it to the end zone. So that's exactly what the Eagles did. So hopefully he learned from his mistake yeah. and it doesn't happen again. It was a rookie mistake. Well, hopefully Eric Ducker comes back so we we'll have to do that again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we need Ducker back. But we got to talk about your Giants. It'd be the rest of 32-21. Uh, Eli looked great. He got he finally got loose a little bit. Oh, they'll look good. But I think um, the best news that the Giants have right now is the fact that um, Tom Coughlin announced that Victor Cruz is going to be ready to come back. He's going to play their next game on October 4th against the Buffalo Bills. So he, he could, he's a guy that, I mean, Victor Cruz, he's a Super Bowl winning um, wide receiver. Right. Everybody knows him for the salsa, and that's because he's actually scoring <laughs> touchdowns. Yeah, so <laughs> in really, the end zone. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> he gets to the end zone, he dances, and that's what the Giants want to see more of. And I think it could free up Odell Beckham, who's probably, he's pretty much being getting the treatment that he deserves because when you burst onto the scene like he did, you're going to get that kind of treatment and double covers. So Victor Cruz could kind of, you know, ease the, some of the pressure off of Beckham. Right, and I think yeah. it's going to be great to have Victor Cruz because Odell, he is getting the double coverage, but, yes. you know, he is pushing through. He had the 30-yard reception last game. And then also, I feel the team just, I'm happy that they won because it gained their confidence. And mm. also, with them all together, the brotherhood, Victor Cruz, Odell on the, I mean, on the, floor, on the field, yeah. it's going to create some good football and the team is good the Giants are a good team I can't say anything negative about them yeah. as the way they've been playing the past few games besides just letting the team score in the last few you know periods the last few minutes well, the of the game yeah. exactly the, the fourth, fourth quarter. quarter that's yeah. exactly what it is and because last week even you know um Rashad Ross had a 101 yard kickoff reception and yeah. took all the way to the end zone yeah. so yeah. they can't have things like that and it was right after Ruben Randall had the 41 yard reception so you know things like that can't happen and they're a vet you know there's a lot of veterans on the team yeah they need to make mature moves they need to be strategic about what plays they're making and continue to play the game through like all the way to the fourth quarter they got to play it like they're in the first quarter and don't let these teams come back because there's potential there for the giants and i know a lot of people are saying you know according to stats if they were 0 three they couldn't make the playoffs they won't make the score it's too early game by game and i feel like they could do a lot. I'm hoping that Victor Cruz mm-hmm. could come in. But you know what's frustrating? The NFC East is wide open. It's wide right. open. Des Bryant and Tony Romo aren't playing. Yeah. The Eagles look suspect. Mm-hmm. And the Giants still have a chance to take control of the division. What do you think? But I think even with Dallas, with their injuries, they, I think they're still the favorite yeah, to come course. out of the East with the, um, with the yeah. win, with yeah. the title. But, um, you know, I've been really surprised by the Giants yes. coming into the season. I thought that they really had a lot of deficiencies on the offensive line yeah. and on the defensive side of the ball. Um, there were some indications in the preseason where the, that line wasn't going to hold up yeah. very well and they're not going to be able to rush the passer. Mm-hmm. So coming into the season, the third, we're in third ga- three games in, yeah. I'm surprised that Eli has been able to have the protection to yeah. throw some passes they haven't always been the long balls yeah they're doing a lot of short passes little intermediate passes right, exactly. to get the, the ball moving down the court yeah. i mean the field sorry <laughs> <laughs> um 
but it was nice to see I, I the defense has really stepped up right I thought that they were gonna have a really tough time keeping opponents from scoring but yeah. they've done their part even when the offense has struggled but they still have def deficiencies in the fact that we don't have a pass rush yeah there's no body to really hurry the quarterback yeah. and when you have quarterbacks like Romo and uh, Manning. Like Manning, even though we don't play yeah. Peyton, <laughs> but you know anybody of yeah. that Out there, caliber. Exactly. Real give, Wilson. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you give them a lot of time to throw, they're going to torch the defense. Exactly. It's going to put the secondary in a precarious position to hold their man in check. So uh -huh. I, I think this is a good step in the right, in the right direction. And they did close the game out, which they hadn't done in the first couple of games. I was worried with that yeah. 101 reception. I was exactly. like, here we go again. Yeah. Exactly. Not anymore. I can't take it. But yeah. I think this is going to be a, a good step, a confidence builder going yeah. into the Bills game. Yeah. And we'll see what happens. And I think this is yeah. do or die for Tom Coughlin. It is. Yeah. And exactly. if we come out with a losing season, I think he's going to go. And then I'm going to start looking at Jerry Reese because I feel like <laughs> yeah. the talent is really not coming yeah. in the way it should be. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I'm not going to lie. I'm really scared for you guys next week because the Bills <laughs> are serious. I mean, like, when Russ Bryant had the Jets, he really showed how he can win against two FC championships two straight years. And then he showed me how bad it could be when he doesn't have the players. But with the Bills, he actually really has players that fit his mold and what he wants to do. He has McCoy running the ball. Right. He has a dual threat quarterback. And um, you know Tyrod Taylor, and he has some receivers. They got a great defense. They rush the passer, and you just talked about you know the Giants' offensive line. That could be a problem next week. Exactly. We have to stay tuned and see. Like I said, the Giants are you know their talent is there. Yeah. They just need to be like serious about the decisions that they're making on the field and yeah. strategic. Wow, these are really good. You act surprised. Practice makes perfect. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of teens in foster care who don't need perfection. They need you. You also have some news about Chakali and the Eagles. Yes. So at the end of the 2012-2013 season, the Philadelphia Eagles fired longtime head coach Andy Reid. Mm -hmm. And when the Eagles hired Chip Kelly, he was a breath of fresh air for the organization. He was going to come in, bring about changes, a new high-powered offense. He had success on the collegiate level with his style of offense, and he, people were wondering whether or not it would translate into the professional level. Mm -hmm. At this point in the season, the Eagles have struggled on the offensive side of yeah. the ball. So makes me wonder if Chip Kelly's boom or bust. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I definitely heard that he's gotten some backlash for the choices he made, such as, you know, trading LaShawn McCoy for Kirk Alonzo, and then the fact that he had a torn ACL injury and was yeah. out for the 2014 season, and also um, trading Nick Foles for Sam Bradford, who also yeah. had two consecutive ACL injuries. So yeah. it's like you're risking it with these players who are injured because, you know, they're playing like it's it's damaged goods in a way. Yeah. So you have to make a dis a better decision with that because it's is it benefiting your team? You know they are really good. Kirk Alonso played for Kelly in Oregon, was it? I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Oregon, and you know he is a good player, but when they have injuries such as ACL injuries, it's just a total different game. Right. So. Right. But he, he pretty much went art went after the guys that know his system. But yeah. then you got to talk about the fact that he gave up on. Jeremy Macklin and Deshaun Jackson. Right. And those are pretty big moves. Mm -hmm. But I think that, you know, this past Sunday, even though in the small sample size, Eagles didn't play their best, they still showed what they can do. But I think it's based on the fact that Murray didn't play because if Murray doesn't play, Sproles doesn't have the success he had in special teams and catching the ball out of the backfield. And then they ran a no-huddle offense that I think could really help the Eagles going forward because they took it just by surprise and just have really a, they have a great defense. Yeah. So I think that's going to be something that they're going to implement going forward. Right. And they also gave him backlash about DeMarco Murray as well. They were saying that he only had 11 rushing yards after the first two games of the season and last year he had like 285. Right. So I don't know. I think Let's see. part of DeMarco's struggles is the offensive line. Chip Kelly got rid of some veteran players on that line yeah. and that is uh, preventing DeMarco from having the season that we saw last year when he was with Dallas and um, while 
the game was in the right step or direction for the Eagles, they're still having trouble scoring. They haven't scored in the seven of the last 12 quarters, so right. we'll see what happens. Exactly. Mom, can we get some ice cream? Please, Mom, please. No, we're having dinner yeah. soon. Please. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of children in foster care who will take you just as you are. So it's time again to the WNBA. The playoffs are kicking off and the finals are on the way. The Minnesota Lynx defeated the Phoenix Mercury, who are the defending champs, and they are on their way to the WNBA finals. They will match off with the winner of the Liberty versus Indiana yeah. Eastern Conference finals. So right now the um, the Liberty had a chance at sweeping the Indiana Fever two games, but they fell, so now they're going to be going to the, the decisive game three at Madison Square Garden. Yeah. The winner of that takes the Eastern Conference title, and then they'll match up against the Minnesota Lynx, which is great. Also in some news, Drew Lloyd of the Seattle Storm won Rookie of the Year. She averaged a total of 10.7 10 .7 points a game, yeah. as well as having 23 out of 34 starts. Right. And... With more rookie news, Kia Stokes and Brittany Boyd are a part of the WNBA all-rookie team. Nice. Which is great. Yep. Yeah. And that's all about the WNBA. Great. Being a dad can be tough. No, no, no. What do you mean she's not coming? When's the fairy princess coming? Any minute now. <laughs> but when you're willing to do anything... It is I, Cruz, Zinc or Bell. Yeah. Okay, time for cake. It's always worth it. I know it's really you, bro. I'm just pretending for the other kids. The smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. Call 877-4-DAD-411 or visit fatherhood.gov. Welcome to 401 Sports. Now we are going to be getting into stories that are flying under the radar. Yes. Right, you want to take it off? So we have Carmelo Anthony... Um, Robin Lopez, well, the recent, most recent signing of the Knicks offseason moves, he's going to be playing center, and that's going to help Carmelo Anthony move back to his most natural and favorite position, playing power forward. If you don't, if you guys don't remember, in 2012, 2013, the Knicks won plus 50 games, and that was when Melo started. He won the scoring title that year. The Knicks won the Atlantic Division crown, and they went to the second round of the playoffs. You know, they eventually lost to the Pacers. But it was one of the best years of my life. The Knicks <laughs> actually won games. Right. So he's yeah. he's great at that position because he can handle the ball from outside. He's a mismatch for other um, stretch fours. Even though the move has stretch fours and guys are playing more outside, Carmelo is so quick that he can get around those guys and you know take advantage of the score. So yeah. I think him playing a powerful position, it best suits the Knicks because he's going to be relied on heavily this season because they really don't have – I mean, they, they made some good pieces in, the, in surrounding him around for this season, but he's still the guy that has to lead the team. So. Right, exactly. Yes, yeah. And it's also um, interesting to hear because he's saying that now he feels better physically, mentally, he's starting to feel like himself. But it was interesting because in media day, he said that he has no expectations for yeah. the 2015-2016 team just because they're all kind of just meshing together. Yeah. So I'm really looking forward to see how the Knicks are going to do now that he's changing the positions. They got Robin Lopez in there, so it should be exciting. Yeah. With Carmelo Anthony, I never worried about his offensive skills. Yeah. He's one of the most gifted scorers in the NBA, so mm -hmm. I never worried about him. I always worried about the pieces surrounding him. Yeah. Right. I don't know what the addition to Robin Lopez will be. What it, I can only help. Robin yeah. Lopez is established as... A, a solid player yeah. so it can only help but what I worry about is the offense that they're trying to run yeah. this triangle offense I don't know if it's running properly yeah. I've been to a couple games I've seen every geometric shape Square, but a triangle, <laughs> hexagon, so, triangle I don't know yeah. what's what's really gonna happen and it feels as though they're trying to put a square peg in a round hole. Mm. Yeah. Phil Jackson knows the triangle he's had success with it but he's also had a, a Jordan Pippen combination, mm -hmm. a Kobe Shaq yeah. combination. So he's always had the two-headed monsters to make it yeah. work. Yeah, and exactly. I don't know what's going to happen with this yeah. team. I don't know if they're actually going to make a change mm -hmm. in how they run their offense. Yeah. Yeah. But then you got to look at the offseason and, the, and the, the, people, the people that he actually picked up. He chose guys that know the system. Mm -hmm. He brought in Sasha Vujicic, who won the championship with him. He brought in um, Derek Williams. He brought in Kyle Quinn. These really selective moves that he made. Even Aaron Oflala, who um, Carmelo played with back in Denver. So he made the choices that he felt that best suit 
the system that he's trying to run. And then he got guys out of the team that weren't uh, that weren't compatible with the system, like Shane Larkin traded J.R. Smith and Iman Shumpert away because J.R. Smith is not a system guy. So he made those kind of moves. So on Twitter, Mikhail Prokhorov announced that he will be a attending Nets training camp in Durham, North Carolina. And Mikel is, uh, he's the owner of the Nets. And since uh, Mikel has been with the Nets, they haven't been the team that he expected them to be. Uh, since Mikel has taken ownership, they have 177 to 217 record. It's not a winning record. That's more losses than wins. Mm -hmm. And since Mikel has been there, they've been through three coaching changes. You know, Avery Johnson, Jason <laughs> Kidd, uh, even um, the guy who does broadcast for ESPN. Um, PJ Klizmo, right. he was there. Right. So they're losing a lot of players, and they just lost their cornerstone in um, Darren Williams. Right. So that just goes to show you that things have not gone the way Mikel expected them to be. And I think in Mikel going to training camp, I think he's going to be really hands-on this season. And I think Mikel is on the on the brink of making some serious personal changes with the Nets to come. And that means Billy King and Lionel Hollins are on hot seat. That's what I think. Right. Yeah. Well, Pope Ralph definitely puts his money where his mouth is. Yeah. He has no problem spending money. He'll pay the luxury tax. So I don't worry about that. It's just the talent. I think he's got a young team, so I don't mm. expect a lot this season mm. uh, in terms of the Nets. So we'll see what happens. I don't mm. know if he can inspire some kind of change in Durham yeah. at training camp, but yeah. uh, we'll be interested to see what happens. Right. I mean, I was at training camp. Well, I was at you. I'm sorry. I was at Nets media day today. <laughs> And I got to listen to some of the players and some of the coaches and what they had to say. And there's a lot of uncertainty surrounding the team based on the fact that Darren Williams isn't there and Lionel Holland is trying to put the pieces together on having young players as opposed to the roster he has now and how Holland is going to mess them together. When he asked, when uh, you know, I asked him about uh, Jared Jack playing starting, you know, being starting point guard, uh, Holland's pretty much said that it's up for grabs. It's on. It's based on whoever can you know earn the position. Okay. So he's pretty okay. much saying that it's an open floor, open opportunity for all players, and there's no set in stone established roles. You want to see how players are gonna um you know go into training camp and what they're gonna pretty much earn. So the Nets are pretty much trying to figure things out right now. Yeah, they need to figure it out soon because season's yeah. right around the corner. <laughs> Definitely. Being a dad can be tough. No, no, no. What do you mean she's not coming? When's the fairy princess coming? Any minute now. <laughs> but when you're willing to do anything... <laughs> it is I, Cruz, Zinc or Bell. Yeah. Okay, time for cake. It's always yeah. worth it. I know it's really you, bro. I'm just pretending for the other kids. The smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. Call 877-4-DAD-411 or visit fatherhood.gov. Former dancer Lauren Harrington of the Milwaukee Bucks is filing suit against the team yeah. for prolific wage abuse. Uh, as a dancer, they get paid flat fees for their game appearances, their practices, and any personal appearances. And the total aggregate during her tenure averaged between $3 and $4 an hour, mm -hmm. making it really tough to um, support herself. And also, they were expected to pay for expenses like cleaning the uniform, going to tanning, getting their hair done to comply with the personal appearance standards set by the Bucks. Yeah, that's very unfortunate because these dancers give a lot of time and energy to attending these games. And you know, they're, they're exciting, they're entertaining, and it's unfortunate that they're getting paid so little. I was reading an article and back in 2010, I was hearing that some of the dancers were only getting paid $50 per game and just only at home games because of course they don't travel right. with the team but they would supposedly pay for travel expenses they ever needed to travel with the team but now i heard that the wages have gone up that depending on the team like the miami heat dancers they get paid 150 to 200 as mm -hmm. well as the new york knicks but these are the big teams of right, course so right. i'm big not markets, yeah. exactly big market so i'm not surprised that you know a dancer from the milwaukee bucks is having a problem like this because they're not as big of a market as right. those big names but right. at the end of the day they need to get paid for what they're doing three to four dollars an hour is it's absurd. Yeah. It's tough, especially when you're asking them to come out of pocket for certain expenses exactly. and you're already paying them a low rate. So we'll see what happens and hopefully mm -hmm. the, the court will come back and, and have it set so that there's more equitable pay because the Bucks are definitely not losing money. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, right. And so I think it should trickle down to part of their entertainment. Yeah. They, they're there, they're in the games, 
they practice, they work hard, people come to see them, they cheer them on, so I think they should get some fair wages. Exactly. Give those ladies what they deserve. <laughs> they need it. <laughs> but when we return, we'll be back and we'll be putting people on the bench, so stay tuned. My new dad teaches me all kinds of stuff. I wouldn't use this one. He helps me with my decision making. Never. And he's even teaching me how to drive. And that's why cars have bumpers. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of kids in foster care will take you just as you are. Welcome back to 401 Sports. Each week we put people who have been behaving badly on the bench. And Keisha, do you have some people to put on there? I am putting Washington Nationals pitcher Jonathan Papelbon on the bench for aiming a pitch at Baltimore Oriole Manny Machado. He was suspended for three games and assessed a fine by Major League Baseball for throwing the pitch at him. And consequently, subsequently actually, yeah. he was also suspended by the team because he made headlines for getting into altercation with his teammate, Bryce Harper, yeah. in which he put hands on him. Tried to choke him. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> he lunged at him. He lunged at him. Yeah. So initially, Papelbaum did appeal the suspension and fine yeah. by Major League Baseball, but he has since dropped that one. And with the Major League suspension and the National suspension for seven games total, he's done for the season. Huh? Yeah. One of the start an early vacation. <laughs> That's what that was about. I feel like there's some better ways to do that. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> this is a head start. Like he's gonna be out <laughs> before have everybody. HR for that, or you nah. know, something you put in paperwork. He's just looking at it in a positive light. He needed to sit himself yeah. down and spend relax. time with kids. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. My new dad teaches me all kinds of stuff. I wouldn't use this one. He helps me with my decision making. Ever. And he's even teaching me how to drive. And that's why cars have bumpers. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of kids in foster care will take you just as you are. Welcome back to us at 411 Sports. And now these are the events that are happening in the pipeline. So the New York Giants will face Rex Ryan's Buffalo Bills on October 4th, which could be Victor Cruz's season debut. Then you got some preseason, um, preseason basketball. The Brooklyn Nets will be playing on, on October 5th. That's a Monday. New York Knicks will take on a Spanish team, well, Brazilian Pachalato Baru at 7.30, and that's going to be October 7th. The start of the 2015-2016 NBA season is slated to start on October 27th. There are three games slated for the evening. We have the Detroit Pistons versus the Atlanta Hawks. We have the Cleveland Cavaliers versus the Chicago Bulls. Notable names in that matchup are LeBron James of Cleveland and Derrick Rose of Chicago. And in the late game, we have defending NBA champions, Golden State Warriors versus the New Orleans Pelicans. Notable names in that matchup is Stephen Curry of Golden State and Anthony Davis of New Orleans. Then you have Major League Baseball's World Series. It's going to uh, tip off October 27th, and it's going to run through November 4th. So hopefully, the Mets will get there. Right. I think, I think that will do it for this week's edition of 4 on 1 Sports TV. Until next time, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Instagram and Twitter, and like us on Facebook, all at 401 Sports TV. I'm Naomi Gray. I'm Gergi Alcala. And I'm Keisha Wilson. Until next week, see you guys soon.